Shalom, and thank you for listening to sermons from Tikvat Israel, a Messianic synagogue in the heart of Richmond, Virginia. Listening to the podcast is great, but we would love to meet you in person. All are welcome, and that includes you. So if you want the full experience, please join us Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. for our worship service at the corner of Arthur Ashe Boulevard and Grove in the historic synagogue across from the Art Museum. Can't make it in person? No problem. We are also live streaming on YouTube. Contact our administrator at tikvatdirector at gmail.com for the link during the week or contact us on our website tikvatisrael.com. There, you can also support the ministry, learn more about Messianic Judaism, and find helpful resources. May Hashem bless you through the hearing of His Word. One day this week, I was on daddy duty, and I also had to make dinner at the same time. Avi was having a good time, you know, playing around. We have a little kitchen island where our sink is, and I'm making dinner, and I'm looking at him. Things look good. Everything's going great. And then, uh, you know, the next day, my wife is looking at the kitchen island from the side, and she says, what is this? And I turn and see something for the first time that she has just noticed. And my son, we're all looking at the kitchen island, and all over the cabinets are artistic markings in uh, <laughs> orange crayon. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> in order for me not to feel as bad, Raise your hand if this has uh, ever happened to you in your home. Okay, wow, okay, good. I feel very affirmed. Okay. Then my son, remember my wife has asked, what is this, right? She's, this question is still there. So my son actually responds to this and he starts going through the various drawings and expl- like, it's a, like he's a museum curator and saying, cow? Horsey? Like he's, he's dr- drawn all these, you know, animals, which we really depended on his uh, interpretations because it wasn't very clear. So that's, that's what happened to me. And I'm sharing this story to talk about leadership and discipleship. Children need guidance, direction, and help in order to develop, in order to say, use crayons on, I don't know, paper, as opposed to, you know, the cabinets. Uh, and, and we are the same. We all need guidance, direction, wisdom, encouragement from others. And we need to give all these things as well. We need to give guidance, direction, encouragement to others. And this brings us to a very special, unique person in the scriptures named Hobab, Raise your hand if you've heard of Hobab. All right, not so many. Not so many. This is a very special person. Hobab is another name for Jethro. Raise your hand if you've heard that name. Okay, I'm not talking about Jethro Tull, right? It's the Jethro in the Bible. Okay, this is Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, the Midianite. He has several names, Reuel, but he also has the name Hobab. Many people in scripture have more than one name. So this is, you know, should be normal to us. Jacob is also Israel. Saul, the apostle, is also Paul. By the way, it wasn't changed from Saul to Paul. It was, he had two names, okay? And then uh, Simon is given the name Peter, right? So this is, this is very common. So some scholars understood that the various names of Jethro, like Reuel or Hobab, they could be titles or it could be showing different facets of his identity, just like with these others, right? Yeshua called Simon Peter because he was to become the, the rock of the early Yeshua faith community. You know, Petra, like you're petrified, right? That's the rock. Okay. So that's where he got that. At any rate, let's start with an early story in Exodus that we may be familiar with. This is from Exodus 18, and it was our Parsha a few weeks ago. Now Jethro, who is also known as Hobab. Yeah. Isn't that a great name? Hobab. Yeah. I might uh, call some of the kids in here Hobab. Are you okay with that, Hobab? Yeah. We'll talk later. Okay. Now, Jethro, a.k.a. Hobab, the priest of Midian and Moses' father-in-law, heard about everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how Adonai had brought Israel out of Egypt. Moses told his father-in-law all that Adonai had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, as well as all the travail that had come on them along the way and how Adonai delivered them. Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness that Adonai had shown to Israel since he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be Adonai who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know 
that Adonai, the God of Israel, right, is greater than all other gods since they had acted arrogantly against them. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, presented a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. Aaron also came along with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Okay, so this is very nice. So Jethro, also known as Hobab, comes to know the power and rescuing of the God of Israel through Moses' testimony. This is very important. So he's just come to know the Lord at this point. He is a priest of Midian, but he has forsaken the, the gods of the Midianites, right? This was, you know, they had other beliefs in this system. And he has clung to the God of Israel, right? And what, what do we say to this? Baruch Hashem, right? This is a small picture of what God wants to do on the earth, Right? He wants all the nations to know him and for Israel to be a witness of his glory and salvation like Moses was doing. This is a beautiful thing. So then immediately, Jethro, right after this, guess what? He's got a little advice. He's got a little advice for Moses. He's just come to know the Lord, the power of the Lord, and this is what happens. The next day, how long has he known the Lord? One day, here we go. Moses sat down to judge the people and they stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this you're doing to the people? Why sit by yourself alone with all the people standing around from morning until evening? Blah, 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 blah. This is no good. We may know the rest of the story. What happens? Moses explains how he's getting burnt out. And Jethro says, lo tov. This is what he says literally in Hebrew, lo tov. What does lo tov mean? No good, yes. What you're doing is not good. Remember the first thing that is not good in the scriptures, in the creation story? Do we know what that is? It is not good for what? Man to be alone. It's not good for humans to be isolated. Everything else in creation before that is good. Mountains, it is good. Ketov, right. Owls? <laughs> uh, what's a nice bird? A dove. Doves? Ketov, right? Plants? Ketov, it's good. But here, what Jethro is saying, he's evoking something from that, from that story. He's saying something is not good. In the creation, what is that? The lack of human relationship is not good. And Moses is doing the same thing. He's isolated. Remember, it said, we just read that. He said he was isolated. He was by himself, sitting all alone as a leader. What did he need to do? He needed to disciple. He needed to mentor other leaders. He needed to delegate some of his tasks and raise up other leaders, raise up other elders. This is also uh, our heart as leaders for Tikvat Israel, to raise people up so we can walk in our strengths, so that each one is growing in avodah and partnership with God. And what is the fruit of this story? What happens after this? Afterwards, the people of Israel receive what? The Torah, right? And now Moses has helpers. They're receiving the instruction for God and Moses has helpers, other teachers, so it's not all dependent on him, to explain this instruction, to explain the law. And he has elders to go with him to the mountain of God. Remember, there's a, there's a moment after this where they all go and they see God and they have a meal with the Lord. That's the fruit of this discipleship, the fruit of this advice from Jethro. Now, let's look at another story about Jethro, a.k.a. Hobab. This is from Numbers 10. It's a little bit later. Moses said to Hobab, son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out to the place about which Adonai said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you because Adonai has spoken goodness to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go because I would rather go to my own country and to my own people. But he said, that is, who's talking now? Moses, do not leave us now because you know where we should camp in the wilderness. You can be like eyes to us. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good Adonai gives to us. You can be our eyes. You can lead us. You know where to go, Hobab. You were such a great mentor before. Now 
You can lead us through the desert and be our eyes for us. So what's the problem? Who is supposed to lead Israel through the desert? Who is supposed to be their eyes, their guide, telling them where to move and when to move their camp? It's that Sunday school answer, my friends. Who is it? The Lord. And if you said the Lord, you get a Torah point. Yay! Nope, okay. (laughs) Well, there's another one coming. Because what form did this guidance take? There was some visible form of the presence of God that helped them know where to move and when to move. What was that? The cloud. That's right. Okay, you get another Torah point if you said the cloud. And that brings us to this week's Parsha at the very end of Exodus. Notice the number of times that the word cloud appears in this section. It appears five times. That's very significant. And just a a few verses. This is from Exodus 40 starting in verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Adonai filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud resided there and the glory of Adonai, kavod Adonai, filled the tabernacle, the Mishkan. Now, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, B'nai Yisrael went onward throughout all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not move out until the day that it was. For the cloud of Adonai was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was there by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. Okay, so what is the cloud here? The cloud is, is kind of two things, but it's really one thing. The cloud is the presence of God in the tabernacle. And then it said that that same cloud, the same word, Anan, what happened with that cloud that was on in the tabernacle where the presence of God was? It would move. And what, what would that mean? <laughs> That's right. It's a GPS. That's right. A God positioning system. <laughs> that presence of God in the cloud is actually also the sign that they followed. It was also their GPS. Okay. I mean, we all love a good cloud, right? Yeah, I know that when my phone gets backed up with too many photos and videos of my family, what do I do? Put them safe in the cloud. That's right. (laughs) No, it's not safe. (laughs) Marisha doesn't like that. Okay. Well, anyway, I was trying to make an analogy here. I guess guess it's no good. They can't all be winners. All right. But in Israel's case, what was the cloud? The cloud was good, right? It was their guide. It was their GPS. Rabbi Bachia ben Asher, who was a medieval Spanish commentator, said this about the passage that we just read back in Numbers about when Moses appoints Jethro as their eyes. Quote, you will act as our eyes to show us the way, seeing that the Israelites had been journeying exclusively at the direction of the cloud, and the cloud showed them the way, what need was there to employ the services of Jethro? The reason Moses said the words quoted was to reinforce the minds and hearts of the people whose faith in the miraculous guidance of the cloud was somewhat limited, people who preferred to rely on leaders of flesh and blood, unquote. So Moses is kind of making a concession for the people, right? This mode of leadership where they rely on a person in the same way that they should be relying on God is not healthy. And look at the fruit of this decision. Let's look at Numbers 1 through 10 before this, and then 11 and following. So Numbers 1 through 10 before this decision, what happens? The Israelites get organized around the tabernacle in their camps. They bring offerings for the dedication of the tabernacle. There's a connection, you know, between God and Israel. Things are going well. There are various instructions about the lampstand and the trumpets and the Nazarite vow. And the ironic blessing that I close every service with is in this section in number six for Aaron to bless the rest of Israel. All of that is Kitov, right? That's good stuff. Now let's look after numbers 10. Numbers 11 and following. After the decision for Jethro to guide them instead of relying on the cloud, the people complain about manna and are up to their eyeballs and quail. And then there's a plague as a result. There's the disastrous scouting of the land where they send 12 to scout the land and 10 come back and say, we can't do it. And so all the people of the community weep 
and they're kvetch against Moses, and they refuse to go into the promised land. And then God threatens to wipe out the entire assembly, and Moses and Aaron intercede for the people, and the Lord relents and forgives. But the people are sentenced to wander in the desert for 40 years. Then there's the rebellion of Korah, and some of them are swallowed up by the earth. Then there's complaining about the lack of water and Moses loses his temper and he ends up not getting to go into the promised land and I could go on and on and on. There's more actually, right? But you get the picture. Everything hinges on this one event, relying too much on Jethro. You can be our eyes. So here we have the two poles of leadership, the two poles of discipleship. On the one hand, we need to, listen to others that we have a relationship with, and we need to receive wisdom and counsel and at times even correction. Jethro says Moses needs to raise up leaders and delegate, and this bears a lot of fruit. This is a really good thing. This is healthy leadership, both on the part of Moses and Jethro. Listening to those in our lives is important, and if we're married, it's important to receive godly counsel, especially from our wife or our husband because they are the person that God has put in our lives for that purpose. Godly counsel can come from our in-laws, as in the case of Moses, our friends, our mentors, our family, our parents, our brothers and sisters, and even occasionally a stranger. This is from Proverbs 11, verse 14. Without guidance, people fall, but with many counselors, there is deliverance, there is security. However, The other pull of this leadership scale is when we rely too much on leaders to the extent that we make them idols, that they take the place of the Holy Spirit, that we give them too much authority, or worse, uh, when we try to take too much authority in their lives and the lives of others. This is what happens with Jethro and Moses in Numbers 10. That's why it's best not to say, God told me this, or the Lord told me that. Those of us that have a prophetic strength need to communicate these encouragements in humility. Once Scott Moore was standing right here leading a service and he had just a word of encouragement. He had a scripture that, you know, was in his heart and he shared it. And after the service, I told him I really appreciated what he shared and I felt, I really felt it was from God. And do you know what he said? He said, I thought it might be helpful. That's all he said. He didn't say, I sense that the Lord told me to say that and you're right on. And, you know, like he didn't, he didn't go all into that. He just said, I thought it might be helpful. And, you know, I processed that with him. He explained that when folks share encouragements as if they were from God, then the congregation might start to look to that person to see what is God saying, right? If, if I'm saying, well, the Lord says this and the Lord says that, then, uh, then people might come to me to find out what the Lord is saying. And that's... Low tov, right? That's no good. In other words, they ask the person to be their eyes when they already have the cloud. Low tov. So we want to balance between these two poles of discipleship and leadership. Building trusting relationships with others who can give good counsel, but not relying on others too much for our direction and our security. So why should we be in discipleship relationships and mentorships, apprenticeships, mutual accountability? If if it's so many minds in this? Why, why should we do this? Well, because this is one of the most important commandments in the entire scriptures of the new covenant, especially. This is what is called in the body of the Messiah as the great commission. This is from the last verses in the gospel of Matthew. These are the last words of Yeshua in this, in this Besorah. Now the 11 disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain Yeshua had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some wavered. And Yeshua came to them and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And remember, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. Go therefore and make disciples and teach them, right? Isn't that similar to what Jethro told Moses to do, right? you're not the only one, right? You need, to, you need to disciple others. You need to delegate. You need to raise them up and teach them. You need to make disciples. The final instructions of Yeshua are about leadership, mentoring, counseling, raising up mature followers of Yeshua that can replicate what they have been taught. What is our goal as, as parents? 
we want to raise up our children so that they can be what? Children forever? No. So they can be adults. So we want to replicate everything that we, we have done and even, you know, perhaps further on so they can be closer to the Lord. Notice that this was Yeshua's practice with his disciples. What did he do? He showed them how to minister. And then they would go and they would preach and they would pray for healing and they would do the things that he did. They went out two by two and he gave them practice and he gave them feedback while he was on the earth. And then when he ascended to the right hand of the father, what did he say at the end there? Now you go do it. The fruit of that apprenticeship, (laughs) we're, we're that fruit. You have the whole book of Acts. You have amazing moves of the spirit and you have us. That's why we're here because of their discipleship, because of what they did. A small group of Messianic Jews discipling the Israel and discipling the nations and taking the message out and praying for the sick. So rather than enabling and doing things for his students, what did Yeshua do? He empowered and encouraged them to walk in their calling. Now here at Tikvat Israel, we have a specific focus on Jewish discipleship. Some might question this priority. After all, many of our members and attendees are not Jewish. So why, why focus on that? Let's do a quick thought experiment, if you'll, if you'll do this with me for a second. Imagine this. Around the year 300, all men, all males, that come to faith in Yeshua are told that they are no longer men because now you're Christian. So you can't be a husband. You can't be a father. You can't walk in that part of your identity. It's gone. It's dead. It doesn't exist. And this is the prevailing teaching of the church from this point on, from the year 300 until this moment. There's no way to be a man and follow Yeshua. It's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. You can't do it. We have no gender. Then, all men are accused by the church of killing Yeshua. And this lie is perpetuated to this moment that I'm talking to you right now. Then, in the Middle Ages, men are persecuted by the church and male babies are put on swords and saying, this is the cross of Christ. Then, men are expelled from every country they ever tried to live in, including sometimes the United States. Then, in the 1940s, a sociopath arises who tries to rid the earth of all men and somewhat succeeds, at least in Europe. You get what I'm saying? Of course, I'm, I'm not talking about men. I'm talking about the Jewish people and our relationship to the historic church. And so, if we keep this in mind and we keep Yeshua's main final commandment in mind to make disciples. That means we have to disciple our people to understand that you can be Jewish and follow Yeshua and that it matters. Calling and identity matters. It's not more important than, you know, our central identity in Christ, our primary identity as children of the Lord. But if you've been told this lie over hundreds of years, then we have to fix it. God has called us to fix it. He's called the body of Messiah to do it. Kal v'chomer. How much more has he called the Messianic Jewish community to do it? Our vision is to bridge and restore the relationship between Yeshua, the Jewish people, and the nations. This is a triangular relationship. There's three relationships here that we're working on. But the first one I mentioned is what? The relationship between Yeshua and the Jewish people. That's part of why we're here. It's not the only thing we're doing, but it's an important part of why we're here. There was a verse of the day in my Bible app recently. It was from Romans 1, verse 16. This is what it says. For I am not ashamed of the good news, gospel, for it is the power of God to everyone who trusts, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The commentary, the video, the devotional, and even the picture of the verse Guess what, they, guess what part they focused on? It's good. It's good. We shouldn't be ashamed. It's good to talk about that. Yeah, I'm all for that. 
none of the devotional, none of the video, even the, the, you know how you can make like a little picture of that verse with like, you know, put a little background and share it. All of those pre-made ones left out the last part, all of them. So this is part of our charge. This is part of our vision. And you don't have to be Jewish to have a heart for the Jewish people. My main point here is discipleship and mentorship matter. It's the Great Commission. The Great Commission isn't just go get people to make a decision for Yeshua. That's part of it. That's great. I love it when people come to faith. I love gospeling. But that's not our, that's not our mission from Yeshua. He said, go and make disciples. So it matters, especially if there's a historic damage that needs repairing. So the bottom line is this, who has God called you to encourage and give of yourself? And who has God called you to receive from? We should not make others our total guide and rely on them. And we should not direct people to rely on us in order to hear from God. But staying away from this extreme, we should endeavor to mentor and to be mentored. Yeshua did it with just 12. And those 12 replicated that and mentored others. And the rest is what? The rest is history. That's why we're here. So discipleship created a movement that changed the world, and it still does. So let's do it. Amen. Avinu, our Father, thank you that you've given us your scriptures, your faithfulness, your word to instruct us, to teach us, and you've given us these lessons. Help us to not look to others as our Holy Spirit, but help us to be in relationship, in healthy relationship with others that we can mentor, that can mentor us, that we can seek to, in some way, be junior partners with you in the restoration of the world, Lord. We thank you for what you did with those 12 and how you replicated that, and it became a movement for Yeshua that is, is taking over the earth, Lord, by your kingship and by your authority and by your love. Help us to be a part of that. Help us to give a reason for the hope that is within us and to prioritize discipleship to Israel, to the Jewish people, and also to the nations, because we all need you, Lord. Help us to bridge and restore the relationship between Yeshua the Jewish people and the nations, that which you've called us to do here at Tikvat Israel. And in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen.